thanks for having me today for this webinar. Um, I think Tanya did a pretty good job of, of explaining kind of who I am and, and what I do. Um, yes, yeah, she's correct. I do work as a, a full-time freelance artist. Um, you know, what defines an artist nowadays? It, it's, it's not necessarily the guy who goes to the gallery and just hang, hangs a piece, you know. You can be an artist in so many different ways and a lot of a lot of the people who work with Corel Painter are happy to share their tips and tricks and techniques and I think that's also you know a good thing to aspire to as an artist is not only to make art for yourself but to make art and show other people how to get interested in art and that's you know kind of the the core value of, of what I do as an artist through my YouTube channel and my courses so today we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the top tips for working with Corel Painter. Um, for example, you know, you might want to make some adjustments to your artwork if you don't get it right the first time because that's the beauty of working digitally is you don't have to do things in such a linear way. You know, sometimes you can go into older layers that you created and, and tweak them and you know, there's a lot of flexibility. So we'll talk about some things that relate to that. We'll also talk about how to leverage the power and flexibility of layers because layers are your friend and you should you should be using layers if you're working digitally, in my opinion. Um, we'll also take a look at how to make your brushes more expressive so they can do a little bit more and be a little bit more powerful. And then finally, how to customize Curl Painter to streamline your workflow because that's really important. If you can work comfortably, you can get so much more done and, and be more productive and it takes a lot of the frustration out of working. So, um, thanks everybody who's watching. I know there's a lot of people watching, so it's great that you've all joined me. No doubt a lot of friends out there, a lot of people who I know and talk to on a regular basis. Um, so let's go ahead and start with customization. Um, I am going to stop showing my face and hopefully we can all see my screen here. I'm working in Curl Painter 2018 today. so. We're going to start with the general topic of customization. You might look at my workspace and go, what is that? I, I do not recognize half of that stuff on your screen. That is because I've done a lot of customization to my workspace. I've been working with Painter for a long time. And so you, you might have things where you're working and you're like, wow, I, I keep doing the same thing, but it takes me three or four clicks to do that. Each time you recognize something like that, Think of or look and see if there's a way to make a shortcut and I'll show you some ways to make shortcuts today but a lot of things can really be cut down into just one button to save you from having to click or from having to remember where something is you can put it all together so you'll notice I have a shortcuts bar here up at the top these are some common shortcuts that I use you know we all cut copy and paste and we save so why not just have that handy there that way I don't have to go to file and then save you can just click somewhere I've moved a few down here to the bottom right as well. There's some shortcuts that relate more to layers and these are things that again I'm doing constantly when I'm creating a painting and so rather than hunt for something Corel Painter makes it really easy just to make it into a button and so I've made little custom labels for my buttons here. It's nothing fancy it's just a little square with some text so I can tell what's on the or what the button can do. Um, all of my brushes are organized into palettes so I know exactly where to find them and they have their custom icons too and when you're looking at icons by default if we're looking at some standard brushes you might see something like a dab or you might see the little preview for the brush down here and I think those are great to kind of get a feel for what the brush is going to do when you're when you're looking for brushes but you're probably most of the time going to have a specific use for that brush you know you can use a, a brush in a lot of different ways for example I could select this chalk brush here and I could do a little dab with it and that looks different than if I draw a line and scrub back and forth or if I do a little swirly so context matters and I think that when you create your own brush icons that gives you an opportunity to kind of make the mark that you would usually make with that brush and that might help you to remember visually what that brush does because when you got 10,000 brushes like I have here you know, you, you need to be able to look at the brush and be able to tell that it's different from the, the brush that's next to it. You know, pepper spray and pixel spray, well, what's the difference? They all spit out little speckles, but pepper spray is bigger and you can change the size of it, whereas pixels are just pixels. And so even though the brushes are two brushes that are very similar to each other, I can still tell the difference. 
the little text label also helps. Even though it's just an abbreviation, that's still enough for me to remember what brush is what. And then there's some other things like, you know, preferences of how I've organized the palettes and sized them and grouped them together. I have some palette drawers. We're not going to get into every single detail about how I've customized my workspace, but um, it is there. And if you're interested in checking out this workspace, I have it all laid out um, piece by piece on my website at AaronRotten.com. So now you know why I set up my workspace this way, and you're probably wondering, well, how do I do that to my workspace? The very first thing I want you to do now is to export your current workspace if you've done any customization to it already. So if you've created brushes or you've moved palettes around or if you've done anything other than open curl painter for the first time, you'll probably want to save your customization because if you if you follow along with me now and you make some changes, you might essentially lose some of that stuff. We don't want to do that. So we're going to go to window workspace, export workspace. And exporting means saving in a nutshell. So you'll notice I have a ton of workspaces here, and these are in a folder that I call 2018 Workspace so that I know what's what. You'll also notice that everything has a date, and that way I know that, well, this is the version of the workspace that I created in November. Here's one that I've created in December. Here's one where I went into the future to January and created a workspace, but I'm not going to talk about how I did that. Um, so you'll want to go ahead and save your workspace. Make sure you know what it is. Make sure you know where it is. Um, I might digress a little bit and talk really quickly about the importance of knowing where your files are when you save them. You should have a folder hierarchy. For example, I've got my workspace and then I've got my presets and 2018 workspace. You might have a folder that's called artwork and then 2018 artwork, 2017 artwork, 2016 artwork. And then within each of those folders, there's painting of flowers, you know, painting of trees and so on. That way everything's sorted and you all, you know that it's in an, one root folder on your computer that you can go to and find everything. And I always say, when in doubt, just put it on your desktop. That's what I do. If I don't know where something needs to go immediately, just put it on my desktop. It'll always be there in plain sight, and then when I figure out where I want to sort it later, I, I can do that. So we've exported our workspace. Now, if you want to follow along and do any of these changes, there will be no harm in that. So I'm going to go to Window, Workspace, and let's go to Default. And that's going to switch it back to how the workspace is when you load Curl Painter for the very first time. And it's going to look a lot different. So within this workspace, we can do a few different things. Um, we could add some palette drawers to the workspace. We could go to the Window menu, Palette Drawers, and there's lots of handy palette drawers that basically group commonly used palettes together, or palettes that are used frequently together in a workflow or, or grouped into these palettes. So for example, if I knew I wanted to work with, let's say, papers, here's my papers palette drawer. And I've got my papers, my paper libraries, and my grain all together. That's very handy. So I know that I'm going to want that. Now, I'm not going to take out every single palette that's in my workspace, but I'm just going to give you an idea of how you can quickly access some of this stuff. Now, you can get to all that stuff that's in the palette drawers through the window menu, and then a lot of these things here are individual panels and groups of panels. For example, if I wanted the, the flow map, I didn't want to open the palette group. I wanted just the flow map. You know, there it is. It's going to open the palette drawer for flow maps anyways, but if I wanted to, I could take things out of that palette drawer. So if I don't want everything that's in there, let's say I don't care about flow map libraries, I'll just drag that tab, let go, click on the X, and it's gone. And if I even wanted to move flow maps into the papers palette drawer, I can drag it until I get that blue line, and then I let go, and then there we go. If I don't want to call this papers anymore because flow maps is in it, I'll click on the little gear in the top right, rename it. We'll call it papers and flow maps. And now we've made a custom palette drawer. So what you want to do is you want to think about, you know, what, what, are the, what are the features, what are the panels, what are the palettes that I'm using on a regular basis, and how can I take those and, and put them somewhere where they don't take up too much space, but they're very handy, and I can just look over and click on them without having to dig for them in a menu. Um, there's also a lot of flyout menus up here at the top where you can access a lot of stuff. So you might find that it's not necessary to have a palette here, such as papers, if you can usually get to the papers from up here. Now, for me, I like to have access to the paper properties, so I prefer to have paper panels open. 
Um, so we know how to add palette drawers, we know how to add palettes. Let's take a look at how to create a shortcut. So we'll go to the window menu, we'll go to custom palette, and then we'll go to add command. And this is going to add a command to a custom palette. It's a palette that we define or we create that doesn't exist already in Curl Painter. So all you need to do at this point now is decide which palette you want to add it to. You could create a new palette or I could add it to my existing shortcuts palette. Um, this normally wouldn't show up on your computer, but it is on mine because I've imported it once before. So I'm going to just select new. I'll create a new palette. And then you just pick the command. So let's say that there's a particular feature that, or a particular command that you want to add here. So we could go to, let's say, effects, tonal control, adjust colors. Let's say we adjust our colors all the time and you don't want to have to click up in that menu to get to that. Let's click on add creates a new palette. There's your adjust colors button that will adjust colors. And if we were to bring up a piece of artwork where we want to adjust the colors, then we can do that. So here is kind of a, this is somewhere, I don't know, three quarters of the way through the painting, not the completed version of the painting, but kind of a, a intermediate version, if you will. And if I click on adjust colors, one click, and there we go. I can change the hue of this and make it all kinds of crazy. Now I actually need to get my layers palette back. So what I did here, this is the beauty of technology. I tried to make it easier for you to see ahead of time, so I made my screen size or bigger. And what that did is that hid my little palettes over here. So if you're ever having that problem, Maybe you've imported my workspace and you're going, wait a minute, there's some palettes missing. On Windows, what I did is I just right clicked on the desktop, I went to display properties, and then I had my display on 125. So if you actually find that your palettes are too small, you can increase the size of them using this, which is what I did. But in doing that, because this palette had previously been opened on that larger screen, it's, it's hiding off over here where you can't see it. So now I can get it back. And now I can change my scaling back to 125 so you can actually see what's on these labels. And there's my layers palette. I was, I saw that coming a few steps ago and I'm like, uh oh, where's my color and my layers? But no worries, it's very easy to get back and there's a reason why it happens. So we can see that the reason why nothing happened when I clicked adjust colors and I looked like a fool is because I need to go to layers drop all first because I was working on a layered document. So I'm going to go to adjust colors now and there we go. There's my ugly color choice. Bam. One click rather than going to effects, tonal control, and then looking in that menu and going to adjust colors. So you could add many, many, many things. You can add so many different things as a shortcut. I mean, try it and see. You can also add brushes to your custom palette now. Let's say I want this real to be a pencil. I'm going to hold shift, drag on the icon, drag it over and let go, and there we go. Now I have a, a pencil. If I want a paper, I can drag a paper over. I can drag a lot of different things over here. I can drag a flow map over here just by holding shift. And now all of the stuff that I use all of the time is just right there. It's just one click. And just think about how, how quickly that's going to speed things up. You don't have to waste time with each painting scratching your head going, where is that paper that I made or where is that brush? It's all right there. So we got our custom palette. If we want to rearrange things, we can hold shift and we can change the position if we want to make it look fancy like this. You could also right click on a brush and you could choose text view if you prefer the text view or icon view if you want a little squished down icon. I prefer text view or creating my own custom icons and we'll come to that in a little bit. So I know that was kind of a a whirlwind of information. I, I believe this will be um, recorded and available later, so you can always slow it down and then <laughs> maybe you'll, I won't, I won't be so quick. This is what happens when you work with Painter a lot. You become very, very quick, and I think sometimes when you're teaching it's necessary to, to slow down, but I'm not always great at that. So I have, I have videos that are like, um, you know, paintings of landscapes and 
what would take some people like 30 hours, I end up doing in just a few hours, and so I have to try to try very hard to like circle things and stuff like that. But anyways, um, let's let's take a look at making that custom brush icon that I talked about a minute ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open something here. If I can find it, I talked all about how organized I am, and then where is that folder? There it is. You can't see what I'm doing. I'm just I'm I'm talking about what I'm doing. Okay. I'll I'll show you the folder here. So I have presets, common assets, brush icons. I am organized, I promise. And then I have brush icons, which is just a little, let's see what size this is. It is 40 by 40 pixels. So that, in my opinion, works well as a brush icon. And all it really is is a, it's a background that's not white. It more or less matches the color of the interface already. I don't, I don't really, in my opinion, adding color is not really helpful because it can kind of skew your perception of other colors. So I prefer just to leave everything pretty neutral. And I have a little blob, and I, I just make sure that I always sample that blob by holding Alt or Option on my keyboard to sample that exact color. That way, this color that I use as my little brush stroke is always going to be the same. And then I can just delete that. So I'll select all with Control A and go to Edit clear, and then deselect. So I have that color sampled, I have my real 2B pencil, and now if I want to make my little mark for my 2B pencil, maybe that's the kind of mark that I would make, but again, you might use it in a lot of different ways. You might use it like that just to add texture, it might be very thin, and you might make lines, you know, there's so many different things you could do with it. You could make a little blob like that, but think about how you would use that particular brush. And if this is very, very tiny, which it very well may be, I'll just make it bigger just so we can still see it. Now it looks all pixelated because it's much bigger than it should be, but... And then I also have my label here, which is just a text layer. And since I save this as a riff, I can edit the text and I can call this... Now I can't type in real 2B pencil because that'll be too big, or in, and if I put the whole name in there, then it'll be such a small font that you won't be able to read it. So I would do something like maybe R2B, you know, or if I needed to add a fourth character, I could do that, but uh, I'd probably call it R2B. It's going to be the next droid in the upcoming Star Wars movie, I'm sure. So there's my icon, and then I need to save that, but I don't want to save over my template here because I want to be able to use that again, so I'm going to go to Save As, and then I'm going to put it in that same folder, but this time it's going to go into Common Assets Brush Icons, and then I have a folder specifically for 2018. I'm going to save it as a PNG, but you can also save it as a JPEG. That's up to you. I'll give it the same name, R2B, I think that's what I called it. Yes, R2B short memory span here. Click on save. Now all I need to do is right click on the real 2B pencil. I think on Mac you hold down option and click to get the right click. And I'll choose set custom icon and then I will go back to that folder and common assets, brush icons, 2018 and then R2B open, and there we go. I have a custom icon. Uh, if we compare that to what you would see if you just had the, the brush selected as a dab, yeah, it's more or less the same thing, but again, if you, used a, if you used a stroke that was not exactly like this stroke here, you know, maybe it would help you remember what that brush does a little bit better. Plus, it just looks cool to have your own custom brush icons, you know? I mean, that's, that's how it is when you work with traditional media. You have everything set up in a very specific way on your desk. This is the digital equivalent of that.
So brush icons. Um, another thing that you that might save you a little bit of time are custom canvas presets. Let's say I'm always going and making a canvas that is 14 by 11 at 150 pixels per inch. Uh, but then maybe sometimes you know I do 8 by 10 or, or other common sizes. We can save that then as a preset. If we go to canvas preset, then there's already some presets here. But we can click the plus icon. We can call this 14 by 11 at 150. Click on save. And now, even if we start out and we're on a you know, completely different preset here, we can get our 11 by 14. And so what you could do is you could go in here and you could create presets for each standard print size or, or whatever common print sizes that you work at. I'll even have some that are just a screen resolution. So let's say I want to set it to pixels and I want to have a 1920 by 1080 canvas because I'm going to do a, a painting of something and I'm going to record it in a YouTube video. This is a, a standard HD size for video on YouTube. So that might come in handy too. I might want to save that as a preset. I could call it 1080p. Whatever you want to call it, it's fine. And there we go. And these will all save with your workspace. All of this customization we're doing, the location of these palettes, the grouping of these palettes, these custom icons, um, the, the canvas size presets, all of this can be saved with your workspace. Um, in the color picker here, one thing that I do quite often is I change it from RGB, which it is by default, which displays your color as red, green, and blue, or a mixture of the three. And I find that that works really well for picking colors if you're a computer but it doesn't really work well for the human brain. So in the top right of this palette, I click on display as HSV, and then you've got your hue, your saturation, and your value. Now hue, saturation, and value, or they seem a little complex at first, but they're actually pretty easy to explain. The hue is on this ring here, and that controls the pure color. Is it a red color? Is it a green color? Is it a blue color? That's on this ring. And so when I'm picking a color, I'm thinking about the hue, saturation, and value. So I'm thinking about the hue first. Is it a sky? Okay, it's a blue sky. So I just I know that it's in this range here. And then I want to think about the saturation, which is on this horizontal axis here, going from the flat end here to the pointy end. And you can see when I move it left and right, look, that little saturation S slider is moving side to side. So that's controlling whether or not it's dull and gray or whether it has more saturation of the color in it here. And then the value is this vertical axis up and down, and that's, is it a light color, is it a dark color, is it somewhere in between? So I go one, two, three, and you could do it in any order, whatever you prefer, but I usually, if I'm gonna pick a sky color, I know it's gonna be a blue hue. And then I kind of simultaneously will, will pick the saturation and value. So, you know, it might be somewhere up here, kind of a bright sky. And then if I need to make some changes, you know, I need to dull it down a little bit, I'll just go to the left to desaturate it. Or if I wanted to make it brighter, I just keep going up to add value. You can move these sliders too. So if you wanted to, you know, just make it just ever so slightly less saturated, you could just drag that slider just a little bit. Or you could make a change. You could say I want it to be, you know, 231, so that it's only a little bit more, a little bit less saturated. So that's a very helpful change there, and it might make it a lot easier for you to pick colors. I do have some great videos on my YouTube channel if you search for color theory that go into more detail about how much value you can get out of this color wheel here. Um, now let's take a look at, let's go back to my window here. Let's take a look at customizing brushes as it pertains to the pen pressure because that that's one of the first challenges is getting used to using the brushes. So I'm going to select in the artist's favorites, favorites category. This might be in a different category if you're using an older version of Painter, so you might just want to do a search for scratch board tool. This is a brush that responds very well to pen pressure. So I'm going to hold down Control and Alt or Option on my keyboard, and this is going to let me tap and drag with my pen to size my brush. The size of this green circle is the size of the brush that I'm going to get if I use maximum pressure. So if I use light pressure, I get a thin line. If I use heavy pressure, I get a thick line. We all know that. 
But did you know that you can customize that pen pressure? So let's say you're really struggling to get, you know, a thick to thin line and it looks like that or something because, you know, your, your pen pressure is not calibrated. Not everybody's hand is the same. Not everybody uses the same strength. Not everybody presses down as hard as me and, you know, almost pokes a hole in the screen. So I have very firm pressure that I use. Um, what you want to do is you want to search your computer for Wacom tablet properties. It's also available usually in the control panel area. That'll give you this palette here. And under tip feel, you can customize it to be softer or firmer. Now I press down more firm, so I'm going to set it down closer to firm, just one notch from the default. I can test that pressure here and I can see how difficult or how easy it is to reach maximum pressure. And it may take some tries. It may take making a change and then going back and forth a few times and changing it back and forth until you find that sweet spot. Now that's going to change the pen pressure globally for all the brushes in Curl Painter. Um, you can specify a different pressure setting per application. I won't get into that. That's a little more advanced, but you can click this plus button here. And long story short, if you want to have completely different settings for Photoshop compared to Corel Painter, you can do that. But I'm just going to do a global setting. And that will calibrate the pen pressure overall, but you can also do a second level of calibration to your pens to further customize their responsiveness per brush. So this scratchboard tool I'm using could have different pen pressure than a chalk brush. So to do that, we want to go to the general panel. If you're using an older version of Corel Painter, you can also hunt for this in the window menu. And we want brush calibration. We want to enable brush calibration first to enable it for this brush. And we can change these sliders here, but the quicker and more intuitive way to do it is to click on this icon here in the bottom right. And we can draw the pressure. So I'm using very heavy pressure, my maximum pressure, and then very light pressure all in that same stroke. And what that's saying to Curl Painter is that's the kind of pressure that I intend to use with this brush. So I'll click on OK. And now when I use this brush, I get a more responsive pen pressure. It, it m matches more closely what I feel like I'm doing with my pen versus what's showing up on the screen. There's other applications where, where you might want to use that. Let's say I want a chalk brush. So let's see, chalk, pastel, and crayons, and maybe we want square hard pastel. I said chalk, but you know what, we'll use pastel because depending on how you think about it, this could be chalk or pastel. So this brush uses a lot of paper green, and if I press very lightly with it, I can get this nice sandy texture. This might be great for like stubble or sand on a beach or something, right? But if I press down too hard, then I get something like this, and that might work well for a tree or something. But let's say I'm having trouble getting one or the other because of the amount of pen pressure that is being sent to Curl Painter. Well, maybe if we calibrate this by enabling brush calibration for this brush specifically, and then brush calibration settings, we can just push down really, really hard here, not using any light pressure at all. Click on OK. And when we paint with this brush, then we're getting almost always this big, thick line. It's very, very hard to get that light texture that we were looking at earlier. So if we go back and we calibrate it again, and this time we do very, very light pressure and no heavy pressure. Oops, I'll try that again. Maybe this is the wrong brush to use for this. Yes, yeah, so let me try it with a chalk brush. I knew I should not have picked pastel. Darn you, pastel. You foiled me again. I know what I'll do. Is I want a very specific brush here. Now, that's one thing to point out, that even though a brush looks a certain way, sometimes names and categories are just that, and it doesn't necessarily define what technology that brush is using. And so you may have a particular brush that you think works a certain way and then it doesn't. So the brush that I want here is my good old trusty chalk. And this is based off of a square chalk brush. 
And if I go to my brush calibration here, and I take a look at the settings, this is how it's set, and that's exactly how I did it with the other brush, but what I get now is a brush that takes a lot of pressure to ever build up too thick. So I'm almost always going to get this really nice light texture. If I change my paper to something a little more obvious, you might be able to see that texture. This is the effect that I want. I don't want the opposite where I get this really big thing that builds up too fast. So you might try that with some brushes, you know, brushes that really rely a lot on pen pressure, brushes that change in size, or brushes that change in opacity. So let's go back to our default workspace that I have customized a little bit. And once you've made that change to that brush, then technically, even though we started from a default brush here, I'm going to get away from that mean old pastel brush that didn't work. I'm going to go back to the old trusty scratch board who doesn't let me down. This is technically not the original scratch board tool because now it's been customized. And so what we want to do if we want to keep that setting and never ever lose it again is we want to first go to brushes, save a variant. And a variant is like a clone of a brush, but it's slightly different, so it, it's a variant. We can give it a different name, so we could call it Scratchboard Tool Custom, whatever you want to call it. And then you can decide where you want to save it. Do you want to save it in that same category, or do you want to create your own custom category? And I think it probably makes more sense to create your own custom category, because if you were ever to reinstall Painter, then unless you have the brushes saved somewhere else, you might end up deleting them. So you can click this plus button here, and you can create your own category custom, whatever you want to call it, and then you can save it there. And now, if we look down at the bottom of all these categories, there's our custom category, and we can put all of our custom brushes here. Now, you can have multiple categories as well. If you want to have your own custom watercolor brushes or your own custom oil painting brushes, you can do that and have them in their own palettes. Um, another thing to mention is you might notice that just showing the dab here, if you want to show your custom brush icons here, you can right-click on that icon and you can set custom icon. And then we can hunt for that folder again. And I'm just gonna, and now this time it's, it's gonna prefer JPEG and ask you to look for a JPEG. So you're gonna see nothing here and you're gonna go, where's all my icons I created? If you save them in PNG. So you just have to switch it to PNG manually here. Now I can just add any old icon because that's not even going to this brush here. And now when I look, I have a custom icon here as well. In addition to that saving that variant, with that variant selected, you can also go to brushes and you can export that brush. Just like you exported your workspace, you can export that brush. And that way, if you ever need to re-import it into Painter again, you can do that. And so Saving the variant is really only saving it within Corel Painter in your own workspace, and that variant will be saved with your workspace if you save your workspace. However, let's say in the, you know, in the terrible event that something happens to your workspace or you lose the file or whatever, that's gone. So why not save the brushes individually? That way you can back those up too. And it gives you a little more flexibility if you ever need to you know, share your brushes or change your work, you know, do some other work to your workspace where you need to move brushes around and always good to back them up. So then how do we save our workspace? We go to Window, Workspace, Export Workspace. We looked at that earlier. And we can give it a name. Now, why do I have so many different versions? Well, I release a new workspace um, pretty regularly once a month and I share it with people so that when they follow along with my videos and my courses, they're looking at the exact same thing I'm looking at. The brushes that I'm using are right there and they're easy to find. It makes sense for me to save iterations because if I make a change that I'm not happy with, then I can go back a version or two rather than start over from scratch. So I have probably more workspaces than the average person would have. I have a lot of workspaces and I do just go through and delete old ones that aren't necessary anymore, but 
I keep a keep a, back, a little backlog there. So then, of course, if you wanted to ever import that workspace, if you reinstalled Painter or something, or you got a new computer, there are lots of different reasons why you might want to import the workspace. You can load it by going to Import and then select that workspace, and there you go. All this customization, all these brushes you created, the changes you made to the palettes, the you know the cust the calibration of the brushes, all that stuff is saved, and that's that's your work that's your you know your workspace. It's like if you um, took a picture of your your office desk at home, you know the location of where everything is. It's a snapshot, and it can always be recalled later, so you can get everything back to how it was. And if you if you continue to work that way and you continue to add to it eventually it's going to get to the point to where you're going to know where everything is, you're going to be very comfortable working, and Corel Painter is just going to be a lot more fun to work with. And that's one of the things I really like about Corel Painter is that I can do that much customization. You know, it's, it's important to me. That some, some people like oversimplicity, and some people like only a couple of brushes and only a couple of panels, and that's fine, and I can see the value in that for some people. But for me... You know, the, the more I can customize something, the better. And then being able to save those customizations and easily get them back, that's also very important. So in addition to saving your workspace, you might also want to save box files. And this is something you can do in Corel Painter 2016 and later. So we'll go to Custom Palette, and we'll go to Organizer. And this Custom Palette that I created earlier, if I want to save this as its own palette, which will maintain the brushes and all of the content that's in it and their location and icons and everything, just like if I just took this palette and saved it. We can go to Save as Box, and you can see I have lots of other box files here for each individual brush palette that I've created, and we could save that. And then if we want to bring in a box or load it, we can go to Import, and here's an example of a box file that I've created in my custom workspace called Palette Knives. If I import that, it's going to come in over on the top left. I can just move it over here. In some cases, you may need to make it taller by dragging these three dots in the middle here. There's all the brushes. There's the custom icons. I want my palette knife. There's my palette knife. I need to get out of this menu first, and then it'll let me paint. There's my brush. I want this brush, and I got that brush. And what that does is that also creates a custom category for that particular palette. And so then you have your own little category here where you can find brushes as well. Then you can share these with other people if you want to. There's, there's really a lot you can do with these box files. So previously, before I really became, before I was able to really appreciate box files, I was using custom brush categories, which is what I showed you earlier. That's all fine and dandy, but that's going to end up being kind of locked into one of these brush libraries. And so I find it gives me a little more flexibility going into the future to, to just, rather than use these custom brush categories, just to save everything as box files. So if I were to add more brushes to this palette, I would then want to export it again and save it as a new box file or save over my older version. Same goes for this palette. If I add stuff to this palette, I want to make sure that I export this palette again. If I add anything to this workspace, if I add a brush or I move in a new palette, I want to make sure that I export that workspace again and update it. Because otherwise, it may look changed, but as far as a file that you have that's saved and preserved, it's, you're, you're only going to have the changes saved that you actually exported. So make sure you do that. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about in this particular category, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions, is I want to talk about backing up your files often because, the, you know, it may it may seem like it's good enough just to have this stuff on your computer, and to some degree that's fine. That's better than not saving at your workspace and exporting it. But you'll also want to back it up and save it on another drive. So you have two copies of the same brushes, two copies of the same artwork. That way, if something happens to one, let's say your computer crashes or something, and you, you can't get your data back, which does happen. I, I've had hard, I've had several hard drives crash, which has nearly cost me years and years and years of artwork and music. And there's most of it I've been able to get back, 
and I've been very lucky and that's taken having to like scan the drive and spend hours and hours trying to get it back and, and resort it into folders and stuff. But there, there have been entire paintings that I've lost and there have been, you know, music compositions that I've lost and things like that. And that's years of your life that just, poof, they're gone. Um, it's a, it's a, a very terrible feeling, you know, there's, it's, it's like having your house burned down or something. You, you're losing a lot of stuff that you put a lot of time into. So definitely make sure that you back it up. You could get a little external flash drive, go to Costco. They're, they're really cheap. They hold a lot of data now. I think I got one that's like 256 gigabytes, which is probably more than enough space to hold all of your artwork. You could get an external hard drive. Um, you could do cloud storage. You know, there's so many different ways ways to do that. You know, I wouldn't recommend doing something like, I mean, you could burn to DVDs and things like that, but there's a lot of risk of DVDs getting scratched and things like that. But point being, any any backing up is better than no backing up. So that's the customization category. Um, we'll see how far we can get into my my deep deep list of bullet points here. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's 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 do some questions. Hi, Aaron. Yeah, we do have one question here maybe we can address, and it's, can you bring in older workspaces into 2018? Yes. Yes and no. Um, let's see what happens when I do that. So I'm going to go to Workspace, Import Workspace. Let's go back in time. Let's see, 2015 Workspace. This is going to look horrible in comparison here. Here's one from 2015. This is a Painter 2015 Workspace. What you're going to get very likely is a message that says, this legacy workspace may contain features that cannot be imported. Only libraries and custom palettes are preserved. So what it's saying is some of it's going to transfer fine, but not all of it is going to be 100% guaranteed um, to import over and look exactly the same. So one thing that I do notice is I may have had my palettes organized and grouped together in a certain way and now they're not but nevertheless they're still here and the content and the brushes are still there and I gotta move all these palettes that are all stacked here and then once I do I'll, I'll have all of my content I can click on a brush and then there's my digital airbrush now I save things this is several years ago, so I've learned a lot since then about how to organize my workspace. This has been an ongoing project. So you might notice that I have the same icon, same palette, except I didn't follow my, my future advice, and this brush that I'm using here is just the digital airbrush from the airbrushes category. And that's all fine and dandy, but I did actually make some changes to this, so this is not the default digital airbrush. It's a digital airbrush that I changed, and that could cause some confusion later if I say choose the digital airbrush in one of my lessons, and the opacity is not set to nine, it's set to its default, which is more than nine. People are not gonna get the same brush strokes. So even though I only made a minor modification to this brush, for me, it makes more sense to save that as its own custom brush and its own custom palette, and be able to distinguish it from the original, which has slightly different properties. So what I would have to do then is, sure, I've got all my content from the workspace, I just have to take a minute to fix everything and make it look pretty again. You know, I gotta move this palette up here and so on. I won't take the time to do that here. Um, there's also gonna be palettes that are now back in their original location. For example, I don't have my color picker like this. I don't use the mixer, color set libraries goes down here. You may find that some custom content like this value scale um, it is showing up here, but there might be other things that you had to load in manually that aren't there now. So you would just have to load them again. But that's why it's good to, to kind of have a good idea of what customization you've done. Um, if it helps before migrating to a new version of Painter, what I'll do is I'll take a screen capture of my workspace with everything open, and that way I'll know exactly where all the palettes were located. And then if you have to go back and forth between older versions just to double check and make sure everything, everything's synchronized, you could do that. Or while you're setting up your workspace, you could use a, a screen capture, something that will record your screen. Uh, there's lots of free options out there. And record yourself setting up your workspace. And if that helps later, you can go back and watch it and then you'll know exactly what you did. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll, Oh, I do also want to mention um, there may be cases where you need to reset your workspace. 
Um, in order to do that, let me just close Painter here. Oh, okay. Um, in order to do that, now this now this is going to set everything back to default if you choose to do so, but you can be specific about doing it just to a specific workspace. So I can hold Shift, double click on the Corel Painter 2018 icon, and it will let me restore Painter to its factory defaults. I can keep some of the customization, which is what I want to do, and I just want to reset the current workspace, and that's that's the one that I had previously loaded from Corel Painter 2015. That's going to make sure that everything is kind of on the same page as far as the, the workspace itself because some things may have changed between Curl Painter 2018 and, and Curl Painter 2015 and so this just kind of refreshes that workspace. Now I put all my palettes back and you know I have to reorganize them again but again that's something that you would want to do probably first before you set the workspace up again. Um, any other questions? Uh, we do have one more, and that's how do you get brushes to respond to pen angle? Great question. I'm going to switch back to my customized workspace. There are a few different ways to do it. Um, I'll just show you as soon as this loads up here. Okay. So a brush that you might want to put at an angle might be something like a palette knife. And you, what you're probably getting is something like this where it's just always flat and it doesn't angle. If we go into the advanced brush controls, and again, in older versions of Painter, you can find this in the window menu. We look under angle. This is not a brush that uses angle. So let me pick one that does. Here we go. Okay, so this brush uses angle, and I can change the angle here, and you can see my icon updates. I want it to be more vertical. I can change it that way. Now, that's pretty tedious. You're not going to want to do that constantly, so there are some other ways that you can do that. Um, you can set an expression for your pen if your Wacom tablet supports these expressions. Um, some of the expressions could be velocity, how quick you're moving the pen, the direction you're moving the, print, the pen, how much pressure you're using, um, how much tilt is on the pen if the pen supports pen tilt. So if I tilt the pen in different directions, I get a different angle. Um, but what really, really makes the difference is rotation. Now, rotation is only going to work so far on the Wacom Art Pen. And the Wacom Art Pen you can get for many of the tablets like the Intuos Pro and the, the Cintiq um, and the Mobile Studio Pro. And I can actually rotate my pen. Right now what I'm doing is I'm twisting the pen in my hand and rotating it, and that's dynamically changing the rotation. Another way that you could do it is you can simply rotate your canvas like this. And even if I select that brush earlier that did not want to rotate, there we go. I can't change the angle with the brush settings for this brush, but if I change the angle of the paper, I can. So if there are no more questions, um, we can move on to the next little piece. How long, how long do you want to go today, Tanya? We can go until we have about eight more minutes. Okay. So I will I will do a whirlwind a whirlwind tour of layers because I feel like layers are very important here. This is obviously something that I spent a lot of time on, one of my most detailed drawings of a of a person I like to call layers dude. Now over here in the layers palette we have a bunch of different layers. We have this yellow ball that I can move with the layers palette. And you can see that it's kind of stacked in three-dimensional space on top of the head. And if I wanted to, I could move it by dragging the layer down beneath the head layer. And all of a sudden, it's behind the head. Now, this makes it really easy, then, if you wanted to not only rearrange your layers and move them around and things like that, but if you wanted to save yourself time painting. Let's say I want to paint in the background now, but I don't want it to be that gray color. I want it to be shaded with some blue. 
I can just paint on the background. I'm not painting, I don't have to go along the edge and go, okay, here we go, and make sure I don't paint over my arm and then, you know, go back over it again and fix the arm. You can also change how layers blend with each other. So I can use the composite method here to make that layer appear more like it's tinting or be more like a light. I can also turn on preserve transparency, which is this little lock button here, and I can use that to paint only on the pixels that are on that layer. So you'll notice that I'm painting and it's only staying on the face. It's not going on the background here. It's because the transparent area is locked. I can also create selections of layers and groups. I can right click on this head group, which is a group of all of these different components. So if I wanted to, I could of course, you know, move that entire group of layers together or transform it, which can be very helpful. But in addition to that, I can also right click on the layer or on the group. Let's see here. Oh can't get to it that way. You actually have to go to select group content, which is why I created a little button for that here. Select group content, and then I can create a new layer, hide the selection with control shift H. And then if I wanted to add some tinting here, that tinting is going to go on a new layer, but that layer, the boundary of that layer is confined to that selection, which you can see here. So what that's done is then I can change the composite method to something like multiply and then I have like a tint that I can put on that entire group of layers. I can do that just for a single layer or multiple layers. So that gives you more flexibility. Let's say you want to make something just a little bit darker or a little bit lighter. or Maybe you want to add some glazing over it, but you don't want to risk painting over your, your hard work that you already put in and potentially ruining it and having to correct it again. Use a layer. Anytime you want to experiment, use a layer. Anytime you're uncertain of what you're doing, use a layer. Uh, when things overlap each other, use layers. Uh, I might have paintings that are, you know, I could show you one, for example, here, something that's more complex that might seem like something where you could just take out a paintbrush and do it on one layer, and you certainly can. But if we go back to this piece here, look how many layers I have. I have the waves in the foreground in a group, and then I have the fog that's on a layer, I've got the trees in the middle on a layer, there's the trees that are further away, the beach is on a layer, and there are a group of layers, and so on. And that way, if I decide, you know what, that beach is not the right color, I can go to Effects, Tonal Control, Adjust Colors, and I can make it darker if I want to, and shift the hue and make it more saturated, and make it a rainbow beach if I want to. Gives me a lot of flexibility, it, you know, lessens the time I have to spend on, on correcting mistakes or recovering from experiments that went wrong. It's very helpful. Um, and then if we go back to Layers Dude here, another thing that we can do is we can also use masks on layers. And masks are kind of like, they're, they're a little bit tricky to explain. They control the transparency of, of that layer. And so I could essentially use it like an eraser. So I'm on the face layer, I created a mask with the mask button down here. And then if I select a black and I paint with my airbrush, then his, his head is kind of disappearing. And if I use lighter pressure, it just becomes kind of transparent. If we take that, one of these balls here and we move it behind his head, you can see, you know, it's kind of see-through in some areas and not in others. And if I go to large thumbnail here, it's going to show us the mask. Let's see. Uh, channels. This is what I'm looking for. Okay, we can't make that bigger. You can kind of see in, in the channels the little black blob that I made. That's representing the area that's disappearing right now, and the white is representing just everything that's showing on that particular layer. Now, that layer itself is only, it's only a face. So it's just this area here. Now, if I select white, I can do the opposite. I can bring some areas back in. So I want to paint with white. I can bring the face back in. So this can be very helpful, not only for making transparent areas on things, but also just 
if you want to shave off something or erase a small area, but you're not necessarily sure that you're going to want to do it permanently, this is kind of a, a temporary erasing that you can undo. Whereas if you just take out the regular eraser and you erase and you use more than your amount of undos that you have in Corel Painter, then you're kind of stuck with that change. When you're done with the mask, you can just right click on it and apply it and it permanently removes those concealed pixels. But if you wanted to, you could save you could save a copy with the masks and then without, and then that way you can always go back and kind of recover that way if you need to. Um, and then I've got a couple more minutes left here. Um, the last thing I want to show you is that if you create a layer, you set it to overlay, and then you select a neutral gray, which is 128, 128, 128 for RGB, or 128 just for the value, and you fill your canvas with that gray. It's going to look like nothing has happened, but if you go to effects, tonal control, or I'm sorry, uh, surface control, apply surface texture, you can add a surface texture that's only on a layer. That way, if you paint behind it, um, that texture is always going to stay on top. So I didn't get to everything, but fortunately, I have many, many YouTube videos and courses that you can check out on youtube.com slash Aaron Rutten or at AaronRutten.com. Definitely subscribe to my channel, and you will, you will get all the rest of the tips that I was going to talk about today and more. Thank you.